I'm going to start with Dana. Now, Dana is, has taken on a new role at the Miso Foundation. She has actually gone from being sort of our administrative office person to now actually helping with our development efforts. So she's our development coordinator. And I'm going to, sh first of all, explain that what that means. Like, what is a development coordinator? Sure. So um, development is fundraising. Um, which is key for our foundation. Um, we're a nonprofit, and to get our mission, we need we need money to do it. Um, so I help with overall operations, with collecting the money, um, going out and getting grants, or talking to corporations, or talking to individual givers um, that want to help us you know, find the cure. All right. So, um, so if somebody was interested in doing fundraising, what would they do? What would be their first step? Absolutely. It's, you need to take some time and you need to think about yourself, what you can do. Um, what kind of time do you have? What kind of network do you have? People that you can reach out to um, that will help fundraise with you um, or what you can do personally. And so uh, what are some examples? I know that we're going to get to some ideas later on of p things that people have done. But what are some examples of ways that um, you can get involved? I mean, there's... There, there's so many ways to fundraise. I think a great example, recently the Bendexes over there um, did a letter campaign. They reached out and opened up their address book um, and wrote a really compassionate letter asking their friends and family and people that they know to donate on behalf of their son, Ken. Um, other ways, you know, on Miso Awareness Day, someone went to Fuddruckers and ask them to donate a portion of their proceeds for the day to the foundation. Um, you, know, third, you know, you can have events. Um, another great tool that people don't even think about is their uh, companies offer matching gifts programs. So if you say that you're gonna donate 250 to the foundation, they will match it and if not double that. So think about how much more money that just brings in. Um, corporate giving, planned giving, it goes on and on, but that's just kind of a very vague overview of what you can do. <laughs> okay, so I do want to give you a heads up. All of these things are going to be discussed in breakout sessions later. So if you, if you are, have more questions, we'll be able to answer them. Um, all right, so we have some great examples from people who have done some events and fundraisers. So I'm going to bounce it over to Marina. So Marina, um, you lost your brother, Adam, to mesothelioma. And what have you done to raise awareness? Give a, give a little bit of your story. Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, my brother died in 2002. The foundation was very, very new at that point. But it was probably, even though in its infancy, and there was a lot, just a lot less information out there, as anyone who is a longtime survivor knows as well. And, but that was where my family was able to at least get some resources, some information. And my brother died in May of 2002, and going into that, sort of holiday season, I thought the only thing I really knew that I could do really well was throw a party. So myself and a few of my close friends and a few of his close friends decided, let's throw a party to raise some money. And you know, as Dana said, we, we leveraged our assets. I called up friends who worked in, you know, worked for major sports networks and asked them for, you know, could you get us tickets? I showed up at my friend's office at at, who worked at the time at Fox Sports, she handed me a stack of tickets for Lakers, Clippers, Kings. Basically, she said, here they are, just don't tell anyone I gave them to you. <laughs> said, no problem, these were not donated from anybody. And we, you know, we kept it simple. My best friend is very, very good at getting people to do stuff, so she had a, a soundstage in Culver City, down in an area where a lot of filming is done. She got a, found a couple who had a soundstage, and they let us use it. So we had now had a venue that could hold easily a thousand people, not that we had that many, but we had a large enough venue that we didn't have to worry about, you know, limiting the size and turning people away. Um, and we wanted to keep it affordable, so we only charged twenty dollars at the door. I think we had about three hundred people show up, and it was a rainy winter day in Los Angeles, which everyone else would probably laugh if they think, oh, rain. But in LA, when it rains, people tend to stay home. <laughs> people don't like to go anywhere in LA when it's raining. But we had about 300, 350 people show up, charge $20 at the door, but what we were able to do, in addition to getting those tickets, we got all sorts of other things donated. We had a raffle and a silent auction as well during the event. So even after getting our, you know, recoping some of the costs that some of us had put out that couldn't afford to just make that donation, 
think we raised about ten thousand dollars and you know it was sort of like everything was such a blur and at the end when we started counting the money and you know writing checks it was really we, we felt really good about what we had done and that we were able to also honor someone who loved a good party so it was you know we had two djs that volunteered their time we had friends who said okay i'll sit at the registration i'll sit at the front desk and i'll check people in when they get here and we just everyone was willing to help and the, the key with these kinds of events is as long as people know it's for charity they have a much harder time saying no when you ask for their help even if they tell people they can't afford to come fine do you want to volunteer do you want to come help at the event everyone doesn't have to make a financial contribution to help your event go smoothly there are plenty of people out there whose time and effort can get you, their time and effort will get you more money than the $20 they might be able to give you to come to your event. So that, that was, I mean, that was the first thing I did. <laughs> because again, I didn't know what else to do. That's great. Um, so I wanna hear a little bit, so I'm gonna bounce it over and we'll, make, we'll come back to you. Eric um, Rubel, you've raised over 200, almost $250,000. Um, for mesothelioma research. Um, what got you started? I know that your, your father passed away. Um, how, what was your first thing that you tried? What was your first fundraising in initiative? Thank you, Melinda. Um, well, I actually got started right here at the symposium, but in 2009, the year after I lost my dad, I came here looking for answers and I really found them at the symposium that I wanted to give back, I wanted to honor my dad, I wanted to help others and I was inspired by Shelly Kozicki who was also doing the same thing but in memory of her late husband. So I sat and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I, I really want to do this, but what am I going to do? I had never asked anybody for money before, I never fundraised. Um, we were the type of family that even when I had to sell candies at school, in elementary school, I made my parents buy them. I didn't want to ask the neighbors. So I, here I was taking on this, you know, this task of really wanting to, um, you know, fundraise and raise money for me so and honor my wonderful father. And I decided to start out with a very simple letter campaign. I put pen to paper, I wrote about my dad, I wrote about his story, I educated family and friends about mesothelioma, and I sent it out to about 300 people, friends, family, business partners, and that very simple letter campaign brought in over $26,000. So my fundraising campaign was born, and here I am. <laughs> Okay, so I bet some of you out there are thinking, okay, I don't think I have friends that could give $26,000. So Dana, what do you recommend to, to people like that who are sitting there thinking that? You know, it goes back again to what your network is and what your ask is going to be. And I think Marina was great. You know, she only charged $20 because that's maybe what her friends can afford. And you just have to think about who you know and what, what works for them. And especially picking an event, you know, is a walk right for them. I know Erica knows a lot of poker people. That's an event that works within your network. Um, and also in our letter campaign, you know, we sent it over to 300 people. So some of them were business associates of my father. Some people only donated $10. So you know what people, you know, can give and whatever they do, you're so grateful for it. So some people can give a little, some people can give more. You do what you can, but it's the combination of pulling in the network together of all the people and being able to target everybody that you'll be able to bring in, you know, the most money. So what would you say is the first step to um, choosing what you want to do? What do you, how do you go about deciding? I always look at the audience, um, the, my target audience, who I'm asking to come, and I hone in on what I know. You know, sometimes I talk to people and they say, oh, well, I have to do a golf tournament, right? Or I have to do, you know, a walk. Well, no, if you don't know golfers, don't do a golf tournament. You know, hone in on what you know. We know a lot of people that play poker. So we have poker tournaments. We've had musical concerts. Um, we've had hockey tournaments, because my dad used to coach hockey. So hone in into what you know, what your family and friends like. I see Sheila and Bob out here in the audience, and they've had, you know, a spa fundraiser. So there's different things that you can do that the audience of people that you're targeting and hone into that. And I think that's a great you know, way to get started. Um, Marina, I know that you've, you've also done poker, but you did a, an event just to, for birthday, like in honor of your birthday. Um, yeah, I've actually done it two different ways. Yeah. The first one was a couple of years ago for my 40th birthday. 
Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I don't need gifts. Like, I mean, it's always nice to get presents, but I wasn't having a birthday party, so people would give me stuff. And I decided I would have a little poker tournament at my party and then also just have out a bowl for people with envelopes so that they could, you know, anyone who wasn't playing was encouraged to make a small donation. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the same, you know, in the same light, I, there was another poker, I attended a poker tournament after the symposium, I guess, two years ago, the last time we were in DC in the summer. And we were flying back to LA and I, someone in the foundation had told us that there was a young man in LA who had recently lost his mother and he was hosting a poker tournament. And, you know, my mom was still chair of the board at that point. And so we said, great, we'll go. Um, and that young man, his name is Fahed al Last year, he won the Volunteer of the Year Award. I'm sure many people in the community saw a few years ago, after his mother had died, she was a teacher at a school in Kuwait. And the students there put on a, a bazaar to raise money and raised, I think, about $30,000. It, for the foundation in her memory. So I first met the head at his first poker tournament, and I just, he's just the most wonderful guy, and I think he's watching while he's driving in his car. So hi, the head. <laughs> you know, he's got, his, his, he's got the internet connected. <laughs> um, so last year we, we collaborated and we did it together. So we leveraged our resources. We figured out who, who was good at what, who could get what done, and you know, he's got some really amazing friends who went above and beyond what I would have even imagined to make our event go smoothly. And it was, you know, in addition to having a great poker tournament, we also made sure that we, you know, stopped for a moment. Hannah was there. She, you know, we had asked, would you please say something about the foundation and why we're all here? And that's really important. You know, you're thinking, oh, I want this event. I want people to have a good time. I don't want it to be a downer. I don't want, but people need to understand why they're there. And people need to know that their money is going to something important. That this is, you know, not some thinly veiled attempt to raise money for, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to disparage any charities out there, but that people understand that what, what we're doing is really important and that the people who are personally hosting the event are personally invested in this, in this money being raised. I think you made a good point of you actually joined forces with somebody else. And I think that that is a great opportunity. I know um, we had two ladies that met here at the symposium a couple years ago, Diana Stewart and Pat Dyerman, and they now do an event up in Washington State. And um, it, it made it easier because they were able to split the duties. And But we, they also can get help from the foundation. So Dana, I'm gonna throw it back to you. What kind of help does the foundation offer in this? We have an array of ways to help people. Um, first off, uh, one of the important things to do is fundraising pages. Um, we can get you help. That's a great way to get organized. Another way is getting you some Cure Me So um, brochures. Hand those out so people know what we're about and what we do. Um, we also have those bracelets and those pins that we've been giving out. Uh, that's just kind of a starting point. Um, another thing, too, is we talk to so many different community members. So we get an idea and we hear different things that happen and that has worked and what's not worked and we're able to share that with you. That's great. So Erica, you have um, been very successful clearly in your fundraising efforts and you've not only reached out to, you mentioned that you not only reached out to family and friends, but you reached out to businesses and corporations and um, how did that go and what, 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 how did that work? I know that that's sort of an intimidating thing for somebody to take on. Um, well, there's definitely businesses that our family knew. My, you know, my dad was in the construction industry, so um, and colleagues that we have, and our accountants and things like that. And I reached out to them. I mean, I told them, you know, they loved my father, and he was a great man in our family. And so I approached it from, you know, why don't you give back? You know, it's important to give back to research, give back to the community. And, you know, I can talk with anyone who's interested in approaching it from a business side and a corporate side. And also going after them to be sponsors, I think, is a huge deal. Because those type of businesses and corporations can come in at $500 or $1,000 or $1,500. That way their business is recognized at the event and they so appreciate it. I mean, when they see their logo up on a banner, on a shirt, I acknowledge them during the event. They're so appreciative because it's free advertising for them. You know, and for me, they're, you know, a big part of my event as far as sponsorship goes and as far as money's raised. 
So um, anyone that wants to talk, particularly how to speak with businesses, I'm more than willing to. But it's so important to utilize that and you know bring that into not just friends and family, but bringing in big businesses <coughs> really helps too. Um, your overall monies that you can bring in. How do you think? How do you thank people? Oh, thanking people, I mean, that to me is so, so important. I cannot stress it enough. Um, I have put people's names on t-shirts. I've had their names and logos, if it's a business, on banners. I make personal phone calls. I write thank you notes. If a business or a person cannot attend the event, but they've given me any type of donation, even if it's $25 or $2,000, I personally will write them a note. I will send them a shirt. I will also even sometimes include a photo of the event so they can see that their name or their business logo was up during the, the evening. Um, I would say the greatest example that I just did was at our Music For Me So concert that we did in June. And for my gold sponsors, I had individual plaques made. So I called up the individual businesses and I spoke about them and I recognized them and I presented them with a plaque. And you might say, well, I can't you know, afford to spend $50 on these plaques. Well, if a sponsor's giving you $1,000 a piece, it behooves you to go and recognize them in a way because they, are, they like being appreciated. And also, it makes it so much easier going to the next year to go back and ask for that same type of donation. When you're grateful and you thank people, it's so much easier the next year to be able to do that again. And also what's interesting is I had some other businesses out there that didn't come in at the $1,000 level, and then they would say, well, I want to be that, I want a plaque. You know, I want to you know, be up there next year. So by seeing that, um, it's almost like they also want to be involved in that level too. So it works all the way around. That's great. All right, so I'm going to switch things up a little bit. We've talked a lot about fundraising. And some people out there may think, ooh, fundraising, that's great. I don't know if it's for me. It's a little intimidating. But there are other ways that you can be involved. So, um, Rich, I'm going down to you. With you. Um, you have been involved with the foundation for many years now. You have um, been in, on the board of directors and you've been a volunteer and helped. Um, one of the things that, I'm gonna stop, pause for a second before I answer, ask your question. Um, one of the new initiatives that we're doing here at the foundation is we're really making sure that people feel like they feel connected to us. And so we have actually, we're launching this month a program called Meso Connect. And what MesoConnect means is that a newly diagnosed patient that calls Mary and asks for medical help is, can say, you know what, I'd really like to be reached out to by another patient. Or their caregiver can go, you know what, I'd really like to talk to somebody who is also a caregiver that can go through this. Now I know many of you know that we have Facebook groups and we have telephone support groups, but sometimes it's just great to have that one person that you know that you can call at midnight when you're down and you're frustrated. And so that's what we're really trying to do is make that connection. And so if you're interested at all in Meso Connect, please come talk to me. Um, you can also look it up on our webpage and, um, or talk to any of the other staff. But this has sort of happened over the years. Um, organically. Mary does. She connects people. And so Rich has actually been one of Mary's go-to people. And so Rich, I want you to share some of your experiences of how you have been paired up with people and what that's meant to you. Um, I guess the seed was planted probably right after I got diagnosed. Can everybody hear me? I'm not sure if I'm. Um, I was laying in the recovery room and my wife, Laura, uh, who, if anybody's met her, knows that no grass grows under her feet, was running around the hospital trying to find somebody to talk to about mesothelioma. And uh, she was told even by the social worker, we, don't, we have no idea. We have no idea where to go, where to look. So we were kind of on this island. And uh, we went home, and we were all alone. Um, Three weeks later, I went to Dr. Taub's office and had my first infusion. And I'm in, I'm in an infusion room with several other patients. And I walked into the room, and um, I had my Yankee jacket on, my Yankee hat. 
And there's David Rose sitting there with his Boston Red Sox hat and Boston Red Sox jacket. And we became immediate friends. And I, I'm pretty sure the same session, uh, there was a, a patient that was three months ahead, ahead of me. And um, she comes walking in the room because uh, Susan, the, infu the oncology nurse, always would ask patients to come in and just say, you know, just talk to us. And uh, if anybody's been to this foundation before, Julie Gundlach walked into the room. And uh, Julie and I have been friends forever. But we went home that day and we didn't feel alone anymore. And uh, if anybody knows Mary, when Mary calls, you don't refuse Mary. And then I'd say about six or seven months later, I, Mary called me and she said, would you be willing to talk to this patient? And I said, absolutely. And that's what really started it. So it was, and I think over the years, you know, it's about six or seven years now, we've spoken to 30 or 40 different patients and caregivers. Every time I speak to a patient, they start to talk about their wife, their caregiver, or their husband. And I, I'll say, listen, my wife would be more than happy to talk to them also. Unheard of. They never, they never even thought about a caregiver as talking to another caregiver. So between Laura and I, we've spoken to many of these people over the years. And do you want me to continue to talk about other things here? Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the things that always troubled me I'm probably one of the few patients that, in the foundation that hasn't suffered through this disease. We, I was detected early, other than the surgeries, I really have had no pain and I've been disease free for seven years. And I always felt uncomfortable talking to a patient that was really having a tough time with this disease. And I would feed that back to Mary every once in a while and she'd say, no, 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 you have to talk to them because you're giving them hope. I never got that. I never really connected with that. And about a year, two years ago, my daughter called me up. And um, she said, I overheard one of my friends at work talking about her friend's father that lives right near you that was just diagnosed with mesothelioma. And uh, through the channels, uh, she, uh, her family, his family had already spoken to the foundation a couple of times. I connected with him, this is Neil Riga, and uh, we became very good friends. And Neil passed away last year, and we went to visit his wife. And as we were walking out, she, she looked up at me and she said, he would talk about you all the time because he would tell his friends, and Neil was, was Italian, he was from the old country, but he was here for 30, 35 years. And he would tell his friends, I met this guy, and he's disease free. He says, maybe there's hope for me. And I like to not show my emotions, and it buckled my knees. And I've never forgotten that, that's really, What's important here is to, if you have the opportunity to do that, please do it. I'm going to tell you something else later, but maybe you want to, you know, the last, the last question, mm -hmm. um, I'll hold, we'll hold to the end because I have a comment about that too, but maybe you want to go to the next person. All right. Yeah, no, this, progr this program called MesoConnect is open to patients, caregivers, and bereaved. And I just want to make that clear that if you are in any of those categories and are interested in having either being the one to be say, hey, you know what, I am willing to be the one that gets the phone call in the middle of the night and to be a mentor to somebody, um, this is the program for you. Or maybe you're on the other side and you are, you know, you're needing somebody. You're needing somebody to listen and talk to. This program is for you too. So please reach out and let us know if you're interested in joining MesoConnect. So needless to say, after all those years, I finally got it. I finally, I finally understood why Mary kept sending it to these people, to these uh, new patients. So I'm gonna ask you, actually, what, what would you say to somebody who's interested? Like, what, I mean, I'm sure there's nerves. You, you clearly had some misgivings. What would you say to somebody who is interested in being a mentor? I would say try it once, it's not for everybody, um, but try it once because it really opens up your heart and, and it really 
gets you, you know, helping somebody else through this yeah. disease is probably one of the best therapies I can offer you. Um, try it once, it's not for everybody, but if you, if, you, if you feel comfortable with it, then jump in and, and, and just never refuse when Mary calls you up and says, well, that's impossible, that's like a, that, that would happen. But, but at least try it once. It, it's something that's so self-gratifying and so great when, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I, I spoke, remember we spoke on the phone last year when you come to this phone? Sure, how are you doing? The flip side of the coin is you lose some very close friends. So that's why I'm saying it's not for everybody. It's a double-edged sword. But let me tell you, when, when some, Dr. Taub tells me, Dr. Taub, who anybody knows Dr. Taub, um, he's a man of few words. He tells you what he wants to tell you when he gets in and out. And, and the last couple of symposia, symposia that Laura and I have come to, he'll always come up to me and say, he says, you called this patient. He says, I can't tell you what that meant to them. So they don't necessarily feed it back to you, but they feed it back to somebody else. And it is so gratifying to hear that you've helped somebody in the smallest way, but you've helped somebody get through this ugly disease. So Thank you. Try it. If you don't like it, I'm sure Mary will understand. But, if, but I, I have to tell you, you'll like it. OK. so. Bonnie, I haven't forgotten about you, but I'm going to go to Maya next. Um, so this is another way that you are able to get involved within the um, Miso Foundation is through um, using your social media and communications. And you may wonder, social media, that's just a way to you know, stay connected with my friends and all of that. But it, it, it is a powerful tool to be used to spread awareness. Um, Maya, what does that look like? What is, what is social media and what does that entail? A lot of people <clears throat> here just looking around the room, um, let's just say you're not teens, <laughs> you're not in your 20s, and I know that social media has been um, becoming more and more popular among um, people who are not in high school, people who are not just in college. And we have seen it in our world, um, I've been at, at this foundation for uh, a long time, and I've seen this community grow uh, pretty much as uh, the internet technology has grown. Uh, early on, as Marina mentioned, people would come to us when they would uh, find us, they would usually call on the phone and they'd say, I've been looking for somebody for so long, uh, and I'm finally talking to you, and, I, and you know what I'm talking about, and that's amazing. And uh, for, for some of you who have just found us uh, in the last couple of years, you've never really had that, because the, the virtual world, the online world, is so vast. And so I wanted to preface this social media uh, by saying we have a lot of tools to use for communicating with one another. Uh, Mesothelioma is no longer isolating in the sense that it used to be 10 years ago. Um, so the way that I like to look at it is don't get um, scared by the word social media because maybe your grandkids use it and you think that this is something that belongs to them. The way I look at it is uh, social media can be an effective tool and I look at it as a tool. Um, in the same way that you would look at the telephone as a tool. I mean, is, te is the telephone an effective tool for communicating? It is if you're saying something into it. If you're just sitting there not uh, communicating, then it, it, it isn't effective. So social media works in the same way. Um, we have a presence online. We have a website that is an extremely functional website, it, it interacts with people, you can ask for help on our website, you can learn on our website. Um, our website will lead you to our social media uh, networks, but I have to say that Facebook, so let's just give it a name, Facebook is by far the um, most used social media network that our foundation constituents um, uh, use to communicate among one another to get support through the support groups, and uh, also probably to uh, connect with other community members. So uh, having said that, 
we uh, post information on our social media networks. We certainly want you to read that information, but I think it goes beyond that. You can make a difference by taking a few additional steps. So um, you could sit there uh, during your telephone conversation and just listen, and I guess that's okay. But if you could interact with our posts, uh, if you could share our posts with your own networks, and I've made a, a comment here a couple of years ago that if each one of you has 200 friends and there are 200 of us in this room and each one of us shares a post, granted none of our friends overlapped, our message would get out to about 40,000 people. And that's a remarkable number. So um, from time to time, uh, I actually get a lot of help in the office and Beth Pasako, she um, does a lot of the social media work. She will say, please share this. Here is a message that we want to go beyond our own community and it's important for whatever reason. Please do that. Um, just sharing is okay, it's perfect, but if you can add a little bit of information to that share, um, tell your networks why it's important to you to share that. Make it personal because they know you and they care about what happens to you. They may not care about the foundation and our mission because they may not understand that connection and that it's, it's the emotion really that uh, will make the difference. So. So what, okay, so let's say they're on Facebook. You guys, I know many of you out there, I'm friends with you on Facebook, so I know many of you are on Facebook. Um, when they get information from the foundation, what are some basic things that they can do? Just breaking it down simple. Read it. Uh, oftentimes, so as I said, Facebook is a tool, and um, we try to keep our posts on Facebook fairly short. But what we do post on Facebook is links, very often, links to blog posts uh, that have detailed information often about a variety of things. This symposium we talked about on our blog a lot. Uh, we've posted links to the symposium on our Facebook page. So you've gotta click on the link. It's not enough just to see, oh, okay, this is uh, gone, done, moving on. So once you've read it, uh, if it really does apply to you, share it. Um, write something about it. Why is this important to me? Uh, this is why. So, for example, this live stream, we've been promoting it quite a bit because it's a relatively new thing for the foundation. We've done it in the last three years. It's been ex extremely successful. Uh, every year it gets better. Uh, a lot of your friends who um, know about what matters to you, who may know why mesothelioma is important to you, may be interested in watching the live stream. They certainly will not take the time or the expenditure of coming here, but it, they may be interested in uh, tuning in for a couple of hours during our symposium. Let them know about it. They're, they have no other way of knowing about it unless you tell them. So Dana, I'm gonna ask you, what kind of role does social media play within um, fundraising? Um, well, it's a great way to let people know, um, again, sharing with your network how to donate. Um, you know, make a post and do a direct link to your fundraising page. Um, post that and ask everyone, maybe it's your birthday, and you can go, you know, as a, you know, to celebrate my birthday, everyone, please donate to this page. The link is right here. Um. Okay, so Maya, I have to go back to you. All right, so let's, let's just say some of these people do not get on social media. What else can they do within, like, you're our director of communications for the foundation. You're helping get the word out there. You're sharing research information, uh, information about events, everything. What can they do besides do social media? This is a pretty complicated question because um, everybody can do something. So, um, but, Connecting it to uh, communicating our message, which is kind of the gist of the point here. And so you have to figure out, well, what is your message? We have uh, many different aspects of what we do. We, uh, our, our four um, items listed on our logo are research, education, support, advocacy. You can be involved with any one of those. 
Um, Rich is involved with a lot of support. Um, there are people like Erica who raise money for research. Uh, our doctors obviously are focused on research, so we, we make sure that they're focused on uh, what they know about. And uh, advocacy has been huge during this symposium. So pick an area or two that you feel comfortable with that resonate with you and your own situation. Uh, find out either from us or uh, you can figure it out yourself. Some people have very strong opinions about what needs to be done about this disease. And, um, so, and figure out who you need to talk to to make that happen. So, Number one, what is it that you'd like to achieve? Who are the uh, influencers? Who are the, the, si uh, the decision makers who can make that happen? What is the message? And how will, get, will I get that message to them? So I, I can't be more specific, really, with this question. But um, I think those four steps will pretty much narrow it down. And we can provide you the help. I, I get phone calls all the time. Uh, saying, well, here's what I'm thinking about doing, and I'll spend uh, an hour on the phone oftentimes brainstorming with our constituents about the best way to approach it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add um, kind of the combination of like fundraising event efforts and working with Maya. Um, you know, many times the foundation can actually host to your registration pages online. So you can set up through curamiso.org your registration page for your event. Erica Yakano has done a great job with that, um, with her walk run. And Maya can also work with you so they can handle actually even all the registrants who are coming to your event. They can log on right there, pay their entry fee, and keep track of that for you. So that's like a combination of two, and it's a great tool um, you know, to use online and combine you know, events and online fundraising together. Yeah, something to yeah. Me. Thank you, Erica. Um, so at least three, maybe four people came to me during this symposium saying, oh, I heard that you're, uh, you're really good with technology. Can you help me use my phone? <laughs> um, <laughs> probably. But um, the foundation is very small. Uh, we have, what, seven, eight employees. But yet, um, we tend to stay ahead of the times or ahead of the curve with technology. We have some really, really remarkable tools, technological tools that we can um, let you use and uh, that can help you raise more money or um, spread your message a little bit farther, uh, you know, a little bit wider than uh, you otherwise could. So definitely come to us. Um, not all of the tools may be clear just by coming onto our website. Uh, sometimes you need to just either ask or just talk to us to give us some ideas of how we can help you. Yeah, I'm going to share a quick a little story. I actually had a lady the other day call me and she said, you know what, I love getting your information in the mail because she is not online. She actually doesn't own a computer. And I said, that's great. I'm so glad you're receiving it. And she said, yeah, I know other friends are not too. So what she does is when she receives information from us, and she's always worried about her friends not getting it. She calls them and shares the information. So the telephone is working as well. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna move on a little bit. Bonnie, um, you have, we have gave you an award a few years back. Well, two years ago now? Yeah, okay. And you are, have been a huge advocate for us. And first of all, what does an advocate entail? What, I mean, to explain, can you explain that a little bit of what that means? Well, an advocate is somebody who gets the word out. And in many cases, I've, um, I started off, first of all, I got my information originally um, from MARF. And without that information, I wouldn't be here to be talking. Because they told me what doctors way back then were uh, addressing mesothelioma. Now, one of the things, as Rich said, we would go and um, Dr. Taub would ask, or Mary would ask, if we would go see other Dr. Taub patients in the hospital, because they knew nobody. And in the clinical trial I was in, there were very few of us who ever met while we were in the hospital. But a few of us did get to be friendly, and unfortunately, I've lost those people. But it gave Mary an idea to just 
go and introduce yourself to whatever patients or family were there in the hospital. And that's how I got started. And from there I decided, you know, I need to tell more people about this, not just the patients and the caregivers, which I still do that. If I get a call from Mary, I say, yes, I will call, or yes, they can call me or my husband. But what I did was I was, I was sick for a really long time. When I went back to school and I put a poster up and nobody donated, I think I got one donation from one of the teachers. I said, no, this isn't working for me. We can't do fundraising. That's not going to happen. So I started taking brochures from the foundation. And every time I went to one of my doctors, of which there were many, I would put the brochures out in the office. And there was also a brochure for the doctor, specifically. So I would hand the doctor a few of the brochures. So I got the word out that way. And I had no problem with that. I mean, all the pharmaceutical companies are putting out their brochures. There's 2,000 of them in each doctor's waiting room. And I put mine right there in the front. Fine, I did that. Then the Meso Foundation came along and said, you know, we want to try to get a Meso Awareness Day. Well, by that time, I still wasn't feeling real well. And this, we're going on a few years. So we ended up. Uh, Contacting, we contacted the, con the councilman in our area who said, go see the mayor. Now the mayor happened to be a friend of ours and we had supported him. And we explained to him what was going on because every time he'd come around the neighborhood, he would say, oh, how are you doing? And so we told him about Mizzou Awareness Day and what we'd like to accomplish. And he said, oh, write a letter to the town council stating the day, stating what you want to do. Do it in a timely manner. Don't wait the last minute, the week ahead of time. So about, I looked at what the council meeting was, the date, and I made sure that they had a letter that they could read and then vote upon. So I did that. Surprise, I got a letter back going, could you please come to the council meeting? We want to make a Mesa Awareness Day proclamation for you. So I go down to the council meeting where there's like three people sitting in the, off in the audience because nobody ever goes to council meetings. But most of the council meetings now are televised. So I got a proclamation. Okay, I'm still not feeling very well. So I still don't have the energy to go out and pound the pavement or do anything else. Another year goes by. So I had to do it on my pace, not on anybody else's pace, which is the one thing that us meso patients finally have to realize. We moved the next year. But before we moved, I had spoken to the new councilwoman in our new neighborhood. And I had also written a letter to the old council where we lived. I got a phone call from both of them say, yes, we will give you a proclamation for Missile Awareness Day, no problem. And that's what they did. I ended up two council meetings in the same week in two different towns. Then I decided, you know, I'm going to hit this for New Jersey. And that's where I really got involved. I'm from New Jersey. We're pushing. I finally realized I had enough strength that I could be pushing. So I contacted every single senator in New Jersey. I called up their offices. Sometimes I got, yeah, okay, fine. Other times I'd get at least a chance to speak to them. And I would ask them, you know, do you know what mesothelioma is? Of course, I'm talking to the person in the front desk. So I'm not sure how much pull they have. But by the time you get to what you are and what's happened to, to you, they're in shock and they'll go, oh yes, we will help. Even if you're not in their district, yes, we will help. So it took a while, it took me five years actually to get it in New Jersey by the time I got through talking to all the senator's aides um, and talking to my senators personally and they talking to some of their friends personally to get us invites into the office. Um, it wasn't an easy chore, but it was something that I didn't have to do on a daily basis. If I didn't feel well, I just didn't do it. 
but I got the things in in a timely manner and I learned what the difference was between a New Jersey senator and a federal senator because I had no idea about any politics. And thank goodness for those two senators that started in the area that got me into understanding what was going on. And I actually did the same thing with the senator's offices that I did with my doctor's offices. I would get a business card, and then I would proceed to write notes about who I was talking to, what their names were. So when I called up, I go, hey, Susan, it's Bonnie. And by, by the 10th phone call, they would know who I was. So this was a good process. It took a long time to do. So perseverance paid off. Perseverance. Yeah, you got to let them know you're there. You got to pretty much be in your face. It's not. And I asked all my friends, I said, could you please contact all your senators, or your senator, and your congressman, or whoever it was? And they did not reach out and persevere with it. They would call, they'd send me an email or a phone call going, oh yeah, we, we contacted them, we let them know. Well, I had to do more than just let them know. I had to let them figure out that this was a really important thing for New Jersey, especially with the high rate of asbestos that's in our state. So then my husband said, you know, I know a guy, he makes posters. He's at my gym. We had posters made. We uh, got in touch with the Mezzo Foundation. I sent them a sketch of what I wanted to do, and they okayed it, so we had posters made. So we ended up putting posters all over town during that, that first Mezzo day, <coughs> second Mezzo day, rather. Very small town. I don't have the energy to go to the big cities. I don't have the energy to go anywhere else. So I put these posters up. And all of a sudden, you're going around town and you're seeing these blue ribbons in every store window. Then, I got in touch with our congressman. He had heard of me by then, obviously. And uh, their office happened to be in the same office area of the New Jersey senator. So we did the same thing with them. And then I contacted all the congressmen in New Jersey. They don't know who I am. I'm not in their district. Some of them said, you're not in their district. So that's fine. I'm not in your district. This is a New Jersey thing. And I sent posters out to every single one of them. In the meantime, June Brett, who was the nur one of the nurses who um, the award was named after last night, she and I were very good friends. And it would be one of those three o'clock in the morning phone calls, like, you know, okay, I'm not feeling good, talk to me, fine. And she told me about going to see the state, the, new, the federal senator in New Jersey. I was like, I can't do that. I really don't know anything about the politics and I don't know what to do. She goes, I'll go with you. So we made an appointment. And we ended up going to see Senator Lautenberg. Now, I don't know if any of you know your politics. I didn't know them then. But he was the Democratic majority, which means he was the head of the Democratic Party in the Senate. And he just passed away. Well, he wasn't about to give us support. But then he talked about, he didn't talk about, his chief of staff talked about, because he was on the phone in Washington. We talked about certain items that were of importance to him because he was holding up a vote. And that's when we started realizing that you really have to understand where these politicians are coming from mm -hmm. and what committees they're on and what subcommittees they're on and all the gobbledygook that goes along with understanding why our laws are the way they are and how they're made. Exactly. I think that. Um, Jessica, I don't know if she's in here right now. Jessica Barker is our Director of Government Affairs. And so if you have any questions about how the system works, she's your person for it. And I know that she's doing a legislative update um, later this afternoon, at, right after lunch. So you can chime in with that and we can hear more about um, what that entails because you, um, it's a process, as it's you can say. Process. Yeah, it's a huge process. And she's had major success with that as she, um, I actually got the, the um, privilege to go on a visit with her um, to Congressman Leonard Lance's office. And Leonard Lance was actually the first person to 
that was Republican to sign on to our Recalcitrant Cancer Act letter. And so we were very pleased and we were going there to thank them. And it was great because we walked in and they immediately said, hi, Bonnie, and they all know them. So Bonnie has been the squeaky wheel, which is great. And we are very excited to have her continue that those efforts. And so if you wanna know more about it, Bonnie can share stories upon stories. She has a great, um, she's been such a great advocate for us. So, and now when we go to the Hill, um, there's all new aides. There's always new aides. And we had gotten familiar with some of the older aides that we had seen like a few years in a row. But what John and I do is we go cold calling. We don't go visit the Capitol in between our four hour appointments um, or going back and forth between the Congress building and the Senate building. We go and actually knock on the congressman's door, whatever district he's from in New Jersey, I don't care. And if I can walk in and I can see the congressman or the senator, all is well. If not, maybe I can see the health aide. If not, maybe I've had chances to meet the chief of staff. That's like the second important person in the congressman's office. And I've given them the information. And sometimes I have to get down, as I call it, blood and guts, because that's sometimes the only way to get their attention because mesothelium is only a word on the television to most yeah. of these people. So now they all know in our state what mesothelium is because we've got Meso Awareness Day passed and because we still go and send posters every year to all the congressmen and most of the important assemblymen and all of the New Jersey state senators and our two federal senators. Mm -hmm. So they get, they get the posters, whether they put them up, I don't know. I know that the local offices do because they have us put them up when we show up. And it's just a perseverance that this is a commitment we have so that somebody out there is going to know what mesothelioma is and where to go for help. And on those posters, it says, Cure Meso has the phone number, it says Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation, and we've had, I think, quite a few responses from that. We're, we're very grateful for that. So thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a reminder to all of you. As you're doing your events um, and raising awareness, we, um, we want to make sure that you're telling people about the foundation, all of the support that we offer. And so, okay, I'm getting the time limit. Um, I want to go ahead and go down the line really quickly and have everybody do one last comment about their different areas. Okay, I'm going to get off topic. Just one thing I, I know I speak for all the patients. The people that are in this room are very important to this foundation. The ones that I hold in on the pedestal are the people that have lost loved ones and still come back. There's Shelly and Maria, Don and Betty, Erica, Hannah, Marina, and Erica. What you do for us is indescribable, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Marina, um, I would just, you know, I'd like to encourage people, or just remind you, you can turn anything into a fundraising event. My mom had a milestone birthday last year, and she decided that she was going to invite a number of people to dinner at a nice restaurant, where fortunately we happen to know the chef, and she was going to pay for everything, and she was going to ask her guests to each donate $135 to come to celebrate her birthday. And she kept saying, do you think people will come? Do you think people will come? I think we had 65 or 70 people that came, and many gave more than what we asked. So, you know, I think the lesson here is, you know, most of us adults, we all have birthdays. I celebrate every birthday because the alternative's not so hot. And have a, have, a little, have a little party at your house, invite people over and just, you know, make sure you tell them, please no gifts, but I would appreciate it if you make a donation. Take any opportunity to open people's eyes and open their wallets. Erica. Um, I would say don't be afraid to ask. Sometimes people are so afraid when I talk to them and even myself, like I said, when I was little, I didn't even want to sell my chocolate bars and I was like, mom and dad, please buy this. But don't be afraid to ask, because you'll be so surprised how giving people are, especially when you put your story 
and you tell them what you've been through, you tell them about your loved one or your patient like Rich, when you really personalize what you're going through, people are really so giving. And there's so much that we need to do. We're going to be the different maker, difference makers. It's not going to be anybody else. It's going to be us at this level, making a difference in research and helping each other. And I hope you come later. We're going to have a session on just how to plan an event and fundraising. And even for the patients out there with matching with your law firms, I'd love to talk to you about that because I've had great success with that too, with getting our law firms to match over money. So don't be afraid to ask and you know seek out your family and friends to get on board because it's all of us who are truly going to make a difference with this disease. Yeah. And I say get politically involved. If you have something to complain about and you complain to your friends, all well and good. But if you want to make a change and you want to make awareness and you want your, uh, your politicians to start realizing the kind of money that needs to go into research, contact your politicians. I don't care if it's your local councilman, your council, your state senators, your congressman, contact them, explain to them what this is all about. Yes. And understand the timing, because timing is very important in politics. And then maybe we can make a change so that we'll get more research from the government. Dana. Um, I would definitely say, you know, funding is what we need. We need it to accomplish our mission and to get through our daily <coughs> everyday operations. Um, we need it to fund the research grants without the money we can't do it. So, um, and it also, you know, think outside the box. Um, a lot of times people think, you know, I only can have an event to help out, to give money. There's other ways, and, you know, just be sure that you think what will work for your network. Maya. Uh, <clears throat> when getting your message across, always assume that people have no idea what you're talking about. Start from the beginning, and if you've already told them that message a couple of times, assume that perhaps they didn't listen the first two. Repeat it. Great words of advice. Um, I am so thankful to these panelists up here for sharing their stories. Like I said, if you want further information, look on your agenda. There are other breakout sessions happening this afternoon that will go into further detail about some of these. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can reach out to us. I, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. But please come up. We are all available to ask questions throughout the rest of the day.